Hi everyone, it's Mrs. Dunlap, and today we're going to get started with Chapter 1 of The Great Gatsby. And as you can see, I'm all decked out in my 1920s garb. I've got my sparkly headpiece, my pearls, and my flapper dress that has a lot of fringe on it. So I'm super excited. Can you tell? We're going to start with Chapter 1. So let me pause our music and we're going to get started. Okay, like I said, welcome to the Roaring Twenties. We're going to start Chapter 1 of The Great Gatsby today. But before we do that, I want to go over a couple of things for Monday. If you take a look, you'll see that I posted your week at a glance here for you. You'll see that in Google Classroom. Um, I would like you to take a survey before we start Chapter 1, so that will be sent to you. Uh, but today we're going to read, listen to, and annotate Chapter 1 of The Great Gatsby. I know I said that like 10 times already. <laughs> and uh, you'll also see a new Google Classroom assignment for a study guide that goes along with each chapter, okay? Don't forget to keep out your annotation bookmark. It looks like this. I went over this last week in my Friday video. So just a reminder, we're gonna be marking up the text, so have some pens out. Uh, Post-it notes if you'd like, highlighters, whatever you do to annotate effectively. And we're going to be looking for all of these um, images, or images. We're going to be looking for all of these um, points in the, in the novel, diddles, tone, all of these devices, I should say. That's the word I'm looking for. All right, so you can keep that pulled up if you're on a PC or try to pull that up on your phone. If you have an option to print that, that's great too. Okay, so what we're going to do next is we are going to start chapter one. So if you could open your book and get out a pen, a highlighter, and any notes that you'd like, I'm going to move the camera to the text so you can see what we're going to be annotating. And I'm going to start a timer because we're only going to read for about 15 minutes today. And then um, we'll, if we have some time at the end, we'll work on the study guide together. But I want to make sure you're only doing about 15 to 20 minutes of work each day so that you don't feel overwhelmed, okay? And there's lots to talk about in each chapter. All right, so chapter one, here we go. Hopefully you can see that. All right, and I'll try to zoom in as much as I can here. Okay, chapter one. Something you need to write down in your notes is it is narrated in first person point of view by Nick Carraway, who you'll see me point pictures out of Nick um, as we go through the novel together, but I want you to kind of imagine who he is in your own mind. So it's going to be the I voice, which I want you to think about what could be problematic with a first person narrator, but this is him telling his story of encountering the extremely wealthy, um, what it was like to be with his family, and also the story of Jay Gatsby. Hopefully you can see this okay, folks. In my younger and more vulnerable years, my father gave me some advice that I've been turning over in my mind ever since. Whenever you feel like criticizing anyone, he told me, just remember that all the people in this world haven't had the advantages that you have had. Think about that, star that quote. Basically, Nick, we know or we can assume that Nick has come from a pretty darn good life right now, not growing up in poverty. And his father reminds him of that. He didn't say any more, but we've always been unusually communicative in a reserved way, and I understood that he meant a great deal more than that. In consequence, I'm inclined to reserve all judgments, meaning he's not going to judge anybody or make judgments on characters or people in this book when he tells us the story. A habit that has opened up many curious natures to me and also made me the victim of not a few veteran bores. The abnormal mind is quick to detect and attach itself to this quality when it appears in a normal person. And so it came about that in college I was unjustly accused of being a politician because I was privy to the secret griefs of wild unknown men. Most of the confidences were unsought. Frequently, I have feigned, which means fake, sleep, 
preoccupation or a hostile levity when I realized by some unmistakable sign that an intimate revelation was quivering on the horizon. Let's stop there for a second, okay? Um, what, what this means here is that he's a good listener, if you see. Okay, he's talking about when he had friendships in college, that he was a good listener and understood men and, and, and their beliefs and their backgrounds and their ideas. Uh, I also want to talk about Fitzgerald's writing style right off the bat. This is tough to understand, okay? He's using a lot of um, collegiate words here. He's using uh, long, elaborative sentences, and this is all a part of his syntax, okay? So if I had to make a note here, I would write the word, sorry, it's a little blurry there, syntax, okay? This is his style, his sentence structure, okay? Let's flip on over here. For the intimate revelations of young men, or at least the terms in which they express them, are usually plagiaristic and marred by obvious suppressions. Reserving judgment is a matter of infinite hope. I am still a little afraid of missing something if I forget that, as my father snobbishly suggested, and I snobbishly repeat. A sense of the fundamental decencies is parceled out unequally at birth. So basically, he's telling us that he's going to be honest in his story, and he's not going to let his background or his family um, influence his way that he looks at people. And after boasting this way of my tolerance, I come to the admission that it has a limit. Conduct, conduct may be founded on the hard rock of the wet marshes, but after a certain point, I don't care what it's founded on. When I came back from the East last summer, I felt that I wanted the world to be in uniform and at a sort of moral attention forever. I wanted no more riotous excursions with privileged glimpses into the human heart. Only Gatsby, the man who gives his name to this book, was exempt from my reaction. Gatsby, who represented everything for which I had an unaffected scorn, meaning hate. If personality is an unbroken series of successful gestures, then there was something gorgeous about Gatsby, some heightened sensitivity to the promises of life, as if he were related to one of those intricate machines that register earthquakes 10,000 miles away. This responsiveness had nothing to do with that flabby impressionability which is dignified under the name of the creative temperament. It was an extraordinary gift for hope a romantic readiness such as I have never found in any other person in which it is not likely I shall ever find again. So look at some of these notes I have. We know that Nick, is he's coming back, uh, or he's talking to us about his experience in the East, which you can assume to be New York, okay, the New York City area. He's telling us, he's introducing us to this Gatsby man and who he was, okay. There's a metaphor here. I want you to label that. He's comparing Gatsby to a machine. And he's talking about him being this great person, okay? And was he great? That's going to be our question. Is Gatsby really great? What, what the, that's the title of the book, The Great Gatsby. What makes him so great? No, Gatsby turned out all right in the end. It's what preyed on Gatsby, what foul dust floated in the wake of his dreams that temporarily closed out my interest in the abortive sorrows and short-winded elations of men. Star that, okay? It wasn't Gatsby that had an issue. That It wasn't him as the man that was the problem. It's what preyed on him. Now, these little dots mean there's some passage of time. So he's going to tell us now a little bit about his background, Nick Carraway here. My family have been prominent well-to-do people in this middle western city for three generations. The Caraways are something of a clan, and we have a tradition that we're descended from the Dukes of Buckleyuk. But the actual founder of my line was my grandfather's brother, who came here in 1851, sent a substitute to the Civil War, and started the wholesale hardware business that my father carries on today. Feel free to copy down any of my annotations, folks, as you see here. Hopefully you can see them okay. I never saw this great uncle, but I'm supposed to look like him with special reference to the rather hard-boiled painting that hangs in father's office. I graduated from New Haven, which is Connecticut, in 1915, just a quarter of a century, a just a quarter of a century after my father, 
and a little later I participated in that delayed Teutonic migration known as the Great War. If you look here when we talk about diddles, you guys, diction, imagery, details, language, syntax, this is all facts. So if you want to write facts or details, if you look at your bookmark there, okay. So we know that he was in the war, I en First World War, obviously. I enjoyed the counter raid so thoroughly that I came back restless. Instead of being the warm center of the world, the Middle West now seemed like the ragged edge of the universe. So we know he's from the Midwest, so think middle of America, okay. So I decided to go east to New York City and learn the bond business stocks, right? Everybody I knew was in the bond business, so I suppose it could support one more single man. All my aunts and uncles talked it over as if they were choosing a prep school for me and finally said, oh, I yes, with very grave, hesitant faces. Father agreed to finance me for a year, and after various delays, I came east, permanently, I thought, in the spring of 1922. The practical thing was to find rooms in the city, but it was a warm season, and I had left just a country of wide lawns and friendly trees, so when a young man at the office suggested that we take a house together in a commuting town, it sounded like a great idea. He found the house a weather-beaten cardboard bungalow at $80 a month. Can you believe that for rent? Gosh, people's mortgages are like $800 to $1,500 a month. But at the last minute, the firm ordered him to Washington, and I went out to the country alone. So this is talking about his house that he bought um, in New York City or outside the city. I had a dog, at least I had for him, a few days until he ran away. And an old Dodge and a Finnish woman who made my bed and cooked breakfast and muttered Finnish wisdom to herself over the, over the electric stove. So folks, we can infer here that he's doing pretty well if he has someone to cook for him, right? Basically a, a housekeeper. It was lonely for a day or so until one morning some man more recently arrived than I stopped than I stopped me on the road. How do you get to West Egg Village? He asked helplessly. I told him. And as I walked on, I was lonely no longer. I was a guide, a pathfinder, an original settler. He had casually conferred on me the freedom of the neighborhood. And so, with the sunshine and the great bursts of leaves growing on the trees, just as, thing grow, just as things grow in fast movies, I had that familiar conviction that life was beginning over again with the summer. You might want to make a note that the summer, as he flashes back here to tell us how he got to New York, our whole story is going to take place in the summertime in New York City. That's our setting. There is so much to read, for one thing, and so much fine health to be pulled down out of the young, breath-giving air. I bought a dozen volumes on banking and credit and investment security books, and they stood on my shelf in red and gold like new money from the mint. That's a uh, simile there if you want to... Um, label that and also we can tell that Nick's an avid reader here meaning he likes to read a lot promising to unfold the shining secrets that only Midas and Morgan and Macenus knew these are all illusions if you remember that term okay remember Midas everything he touches turns to gold that's an illusion and I had the high intention of reading many other books besides I was rather literary in college one year, I wrote a series of very solemn and obvious editorials for the Yale News. We're talking Yale, okay, Yale University, the college, like Harvard and Yale. This is huge that he went there. And that's where Yale is in New Haven, Connecticut. So when you, when you listen to him talking about where he went to school, he went to Yale. Oh, my gosh, we're talking about super smart and rich, right? And now I was going to bring back all such things into my life and become again the most Limited of all specialties, the well-rounded man. This isn't just an epigram. Life is much more successfully looked at from a single window, after all. It was a matter of chance that I should have rented a house in one of the strangest communities in North America. It was on that slender, riotous island which extends itself due east of New York, and where there are, among other natural curiosities, two unusual formations of land. Okay, so he's going to describe these formations, which the first time I read Great, The Great Gatsby, I was a little confused, but he's going to refer to them as East Egg and West Egg, and you're really going to see that they're just part of 
Long Island and there and he refers to them that way. Okay, so I'm going to read a little bit more 20 miles from the city, a pair of enormous eggs, identical in contour and separated only by a courtesy bay just out into the most domesticated body of salt water in the Western Hemisphere. My camera's a little, whoop, there we go. The great wet barnyard of the Long Island Sound. And you can see that's the water here in between the eggs and out in here. They are not perfect ovals. Like the egg in the Columbus story, they are both crushed flat at the contact end. But their physical resemblance must be a source of perpetual confusion to the gulls, seagulls that fly overhead. To the wingless, a more arresting phenomenon is their dissimilarity in every particular except shape and size. So you can see he's using a lot of specific word choices here. That's diction. He's giving us the details. That's facts. Now he's going to tell us about which egg he lives on. I lived at West Egg, the well, the less fashionable of the two. Though this is a most superficial tag to express the bizarre and not a little sinister contrast between them, my house was at the very tip of the egg, only 50 yards from the sound, and squeezed between two huge places that rented for twelve dollars or $15,000 a season. That's like a summer. The one on my right was a colossal affair by any standard, and it was a factual imitation of some Hotel de Ville in Normandy, France, with a tower on one side spanking new under a thin beard of raw ivy and a marble swimming pool and more than 40 acres of lawn and garden. It was Gatsby's mansion. Or rather, I didn't know Mr. Gatsby. It was a mansion inhabited by a gentleman of that name. My own house was an eyesore, meaning ugly, but it was a small eyesore and it had been overlooked so I had a view of the water a partial view of my neighbor's lawn and the uh, consoling proximity of millionaires, all for my own rent of $80 a month. Across the Courtesy Bay, the white palaces of fashionable East Egg glittered along the water and the history of the summer really begins on this evening. I drove over there to have dinner with the Tom Buchanans. Daisy was my second cousin once removed and I'd known Tom in college and just after the war, I spent two days with them in Chicago. And that, folks, is where we're going to stop for today, okay? Um, so we're going to go over a couple questions on your study guide, but I will share this picture with you, if you can see on the screen here, of East Egg and West Egg. Feel free to look it up on Google, too, so you can kind of identify what parts of um, Long Island in New York this is. But you can see Queens is this way, the city. So they live outside the city. You're going to find out in chapter two, they have to take the Valley of Ashes, the railroad to get into the city. But West Egg is where Nick and Gatsby live, and East Egg is where Nick's cousin Daisy lives. Okay, if you could open up the Google Classroom assignment that I gave you for the study guide. It's chapter one study guide questions. This is going to be worth 20 points. Um, we're going to go over a couple questions together. So you'll see I'm going to pull up the answer key and you can type right along or if you want to print this out and write it if that's easier or listen and then type in the answers as you go, whatever is easiest for you. So we're going to take a look here. Okay, we're going to be able to answer the first four questions together, so follow along with me. What was the advice given to Nick by his father? This was um, Nick's dad reminding him that not everyone's had the advantages, that he didn't grow up in um, poverty, and that he should not be judgmental of other people. Basically, that Nick should be appreciative of the good life um, he had a, you know, a middle to high middle class life in the Midwest, didn't really um, want for anything. Nick comes from a comfortable um, background. How do you suppose this makes him a good person to tell the story? Well, he's open to people. He's non-judgmental. We find out he's a good listener. 
Um, people are often more open with him than with others. And because of this, he's privy. That was a word that Fitzgerald used um, to information about people that they might not normally share. People just open up to him. If you have someone like that in your life where you just feel comfortable sharing to, that's Nick. Okay, he has kind of this air about him where people feel comfortable sharing with him. Um, and then good listeners often have many good stories to tell, which is the whole book. That's going to be the story. What is Nick's social class or background? He's upper middle class, like I just said. Uh, his family has money, but not to the extreme that you're going to see with his cousin Daisy, who lives on East Egg, the Buchanans. How did his family make its money? The family owns a cluster of hardware stores in the Midwest. And you'll see that in the text. When Nick returns from the war, why does he decide to go east? He was uncertain what to do with himself and figured there was opportunity on Wall Street as a stockbroker or to work in stocks and bonds. And then lastly, number four, how is West Egg different from East Egg? So I want you to go back and look at that picture I brought up or you can search it in Google. Just search East Egg versus West Egg Great Gatsby. And this is important that you know this, because if I quiz you over this week, you'll be quizzed on this. West Egg is where people with new money live. So think about like the 15 minutes of fame people from our generation who come into money or win the lottery. Sometimes they're a lot more flashy. Like think about the PowerPoint that you watched um, on how people who come into money flaunt their money. They're glitzier. They have all the newest things. Um, they're, they party. Um, East Egg is the opposite. So East Egg and West Egg are equally wealthy. It's just East Egg, you have got to understand, is refined money, generational money, hundreds of years of family money. They have a sense of authority and um, properness about them, and they're way more refined and uppity than these flashy West Eggers, okay? Um, they're both are luxurious, but the East Eggers are seen as a higher class. West Eggers are wealthy, but can be seen as being tacky. Think that like Paris Hilton versus Lindsay Lohan reference from the PowerPoint. Okay? Well, that's all I had for you today. A little bit of chapter one, just dipping our toes in there. So we will continue with chapter one this week. And I'm excited to uh, read to you and talk about the story again. Have a great day.